in a scene in, in Hamlet, words without thought cannot to heaven go. It is impossible without language to know and to worship God. Indeed, even to have personality. And so the translators affirmed, and I quote from them, their desire that the scripture may speak like itself, as in the language of Canaan, that it may be understood even of the very vulgar. Christianity cannot dispense with language as a God-given medium of communication any more than water can dispense with being wet. With all its inbuilt limitation, translation is the imprinting of the divine communication on the rainbow canvas of a rich and diverse humanity. It is that circumstance that emboldened Tyndale, for example, to feel that there was nothing new about his wish to translate. God willed it from the beginning. Had, and I quote Tyndale, had God not made English tongue the English tongue, why forbid ye him to speak in the English tongue then? God made it, you should accept it. It justified instituting English not only as a language in scripture, but also in worship. Translation of the common idiom. Translation of the Bible was undertaken in the earliest centuries because, as we said in the first lecture, no one had the idea that the sacredness of the Bible was to be sought in its incomprehensibility. And that was how Latin, Syriac, Coptic, and Gothic translations flourished. Both Athanasius and Chrysostom call for the right of the laity to be able to read the scripture. Chrysostom denied that reading the Bible was only for the clergy and monks, while Athanasius reproached heretics for barring ordinary folk from reading the scriptures. It was only the disinterest of the laity that led scripture to being withdrawn from general use, resulting in the irony that the habit of lay disinterest was replaced by the habit of clerical monopoly of the word of God. In defense of the common access to scripture, Milton said it was fitting in view of his work of translating the Vulgate that the devil should whip Jerome in a Lenten dream Jerome had for reading Cicero. The gospel is not a sealed mystery, as the KJV translators made clear when they shifted from the general to the specific task at hand. It was no defect in the ancient prophet that he was raised to public view on the strength only of being handed a seal book that he could not read. And in that position, the prophet was mere emissary of an, of an inaccessible and remote potentate since of an hidden treasure and of a fountain that is sealed, there is no profit. From the point of view of the moral instruction of humanity, however, awareness of God's overbearing and inscrutable will was little worse or better than ignorance of God's word. That fault was remedied in the fullness of time when the law regulating worship and faith was not based on race and blood, but on God's salvation for all people. King James I himself wrote to that effect, saying that, and I quote from King James, it is one of the golden sentences which Christ our Savior uttered to his apostles, that there is nothing so covered that shall not be revealed, neither so, neither so hid, that shall not be known. And whatsoever they have spoken in darkness should be heard in the light. Christianity, in that sense, is plain speech. The fact of Christianity being a translated religion places God right at the center 
of the universe of cultures, with the effect of all cultures becoming equal in their status as historical bearers of, the, of scripture. For the purposes of Bible translation, all languages have merit and are necessary. But from the point of view of Bible translation, no language is indispensable in its particularity. As we know from history, many cultures, including ancient Latin, were rescued from inevitable decline, if not from certain death, by the timely intervention of Christian translation and adoption. Similarly, the Christian faith was time and again salvaged from decay by the same cause. St. Augustine describes eloquently that theme of recovery and renewal in his City of God. Converts who learn and the missionaries who taught them were thereby refreshed from a common stream. Thus were the Gentile tongues anointed, and with that the churches range. Language and a common humanity. Having then made both the general point that translation is not an exercise in linguistic perfection, and the specific point about the rationale for their own English translation, the authors of the KJV assured the reader that in no way did they wish to diminish the importance of past achievements or to exaggerate their own present one. On the contrary, in paying tribute to the previous translations, they recognized the failings of their own, saying they were, they were entitled to no higher privilege than to follow in the footsteps of their predecessors by committing their work to the favor of God and to the judgment and prayer of the reader. The question that has nipped at the heels of Bible translators is whether the act of producing so many different versions of scripture does not perpetuate divisions among Christians, create a stumbling block for ecumenical solidarity, and undermine the church's authority. In its proliferating translated versions, the Bible has become like religious shrapnel, good only for the cause of fragmentation and difference. Should we not, the critics urge, should we not restrict scripture to those languages that are endowed with cosmopolitan advantage and allow tribal tongues, so-called, to die a natural death. After all, so the argument goes, not everyone is, is equipped for life in an age of global responsibility and awareness. And Bible translation would serve us all by investing in that global course rather than invoke the specter of suspicion and antagonism that once wrapped Christian Europe. Critics argue that even on the limited ground of nation building, Bible translation threatens a major upheaval with its focus on difference rather than on unity. Since most third world countries are strapped for resources, where these resources are not sucked away by corruption, it is beyond dispute that they cannot provide funds equally for all languages better to concentrate the available resources on remote, on the languages of social and economic scale, rather than fritter the resources on remote and marginal languages. Common sense requires we do nothing less. One may briefly respond to these criticisms by pointing out that the multiplicity of languages is not the cause of division or conflict nor at the same time is the promotion of one language the guarantee of unity and harmony. Italy, for example, has many languages without that creating violent fragmentation. While Northern Ireland had bitter intercommunal violence in spite of a common language between the warring Catholics and Protestants. 
The same can be said about the 1994 genocide in Catholic Rwanda. As for cosmopolitan advantage, Europe's attainment in that respect did not prevent Europe's devastating wars of the, 20, of the 20th century. Something equally true, say, of Japan with one language. With respect to nation building, Somalia's monolingual status, including its adherence to one religion with its untranslated scripture, has not saved Somalia from chronic wars and strife. Indeed, Somalia is a byword for a failed state. The view that if we had one language in common, we would overcome division and misunderstanding is unwarranted by historical evidence, and I would have thought by theological realism. Nor is there much credibility for the idea that multiple language use impedes understanding and tolerance. Accordingly, you can see where I'm headed, the logic of Bible translation would seem to be unaffected by arguments of the demands of peace and harmony. Post-Western Christianity is for the most part the religion of multiple language users. In contrast to the post-Christian West, where single language users tend to predominate. By adopting languages already in use, Christianity makes local comprehension a validation of its mission. The myriad languages of the religion demonstrate the universal scope of God's mission. No one is excluded on account of scale, status, or geography. The gospel is not marooned in Bethlehem because spiritually, Jesus is born in the heart of believers, wherever or whoever they are. Christian translation is about the adoption of multiple idioms and cultural domains, not about preserving an original tongue or place. Christians, after all, do not worship, pray, and sing their hymns in the language of Jesus. The affirmation of Kepler that the Bible speaks the language of every man is a statement about the salvific merit of every man's language because God speaks our language. God is like that. A special word I think is necessary here about the cultural milieu of language. We cannot help but look at how information technology has changed the role of non-Western languages and idioms in the ferment of accelerating market forces. Yet that is a poor clue about the role of language in primal societies. I can recall many a scene of women working in dry rice fields, gathering at wells and river banks, convening at markets, festivals, weddings, and naming ceremonies, cradling their children with lullabies, and on those occasions performing songs, reciting tales and legends, and engaging in verbal displays of the most intricate kind. They pass the time, these women, by lively conversation, encounter, and exchange. For these domestic champions, such as they were, language of the heart can bind and build because that language is woven of the experience of shared community. And we should, I think, remember this primal background of language when we think of the Bible in the mother tongue. The correlation between indigenous cultural revitalization and faith identity is an important one in the development of Christianity around the world, beginning with the Gentile transformation in the primitive church. The vernacular Bible ended the isolation of tribe and tongue reversed or slowed the process of neglect and decline, and forged a sense of spiritual kinship. Just as the English of King Alfred of England was more complicated than modern English, so were the vernacular languages before Bible translation. Accordingly, the simplicity created by translation triggered religious currents that fostered comparative inquiry and exchange.
it open, opened up the tribes to one another. In a critical study of life of Robert Muffet, the outstanding missionary linguist of Southern Africa, the observation was made that the vernacular Bible bridged the old and the new. It was a living book in the sense that it acquired fresh impetus in homebred tones and accents. It was impossible to ignore it. Christian vernacular has the accent of a universal message, well expressed in the words of Walt Whitman in his Song of the Open Road. Whitman writes, I find letters from God dropped in the street, and everyone is signed by God's name. In spite of linguistic and cultural difference, we can speak to one another in the language of divine signification. And being the gifts of God, all tongues and cultures serve a common purpose, so that the parts of our individual idioms may share in the sum of united witness and discernment. A translated Christianity is the natural environment of faith, just as the incarnation is a translated form of God's engagement in Jesus, who dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Translation does not end our brokenness. It simply opens our eyes to a very different reality. The fact that in the early modern period, translators paid the ultimate price by laying down their lives seems a poignant testament to the mystery of the atonement of the one who himself is the incarnate word of God. Translation of scripture was fraught with perils and shadowed by the cross. The whole enterprise of translation seemed then like a fitting testimony to the God who knew the way of Calvary and an instructive metaphor of the incarnation. Temporal setbacks evoke the deeper divine sacrifice. If there is a better way to explain the unstinting investment of consecrated labor and life in the course, I for one do not know it. Bible translation into the vernacular confronts us with a key question about the mission and the vocation of the church. Why and to what end is the church in the world? What tasks define the marks of its true nature? But also about what form and shape the hopes and yearnings of the present generation take. What is their vernacular today? What are the vernacular reigning idioms that must engage the church in the work of God? The church, the Lutheran church in particular, speaks eloquently and rightly, and I quote from their document on the mission of the church, God's work in history leaves global footprints in the shape of new communities of faith, which in themselves, incidentally, may be adversely affected by the forces of globalization. We must, however, dig deeper. Where and how are these new faith, faith communities coming into being? What circumstances best describe them? What are the hopes and dreams that move them? What can we learn about the meaning of history by the growing evidence of God's work in the new church communities which are placed on the margins of power and privilege. What is the meaning of contemporary history for the church in mission in terms of waning old heartlands in the West and emerging new strongholds beyond the West? In the centuries since Tyndale and Kepler, Bible translation has revealed in dramatic fashion linguistic difference and diversity as hallmarks of the Christian movement. By playing a necessary and indispensable role as carriers of the Christian message, non-Western languages became channels of faith and understanding. In their complex variety, languages provided the indispensable channel as well as evidence of God's salvific promise. God communicated with the peoples of the world, and translation is testament of that. 
the rapid unprecedented expansion of Christianity from the second half of the 20th century has thrown into high relief the impact of translation on societies that lie beyond the West. The suddenness and scope of the expansion have, however, concealed, I think, an important theological lesson. Standard theological models of Christianity have presented it as a closed circuit religion whose main pathways of communication and authority have been laid in the trusted channels of the Western canon. Faced with this imposing system, the task of the theologian consisted in codifying the religion, putting down stakes for its boundary, defining its form and function, predicting and prescribing for changes, holding out against foreign matter entering it, rooting out thistles and brambles, fixing the accepted qualities of the religion, and generalizing about how God works in the world. In this view, translation spawns syncretism, sex, heresy, and apostasy, which are to religion what aberration, mutation, infection, and suicide are to an immutable organism. In its elegance, the system of theology reflects the neurological design of an immutable Christianity. Theology has a built-in resonance with the religion's ingrained circuitry. This organic model of Christianity has arguably been the most influential so far and dominates much of the academy and the printed page. Scholars of many different stripes have variously tinkered with it, but few, few have questioned this, its central assumption that the science of Christianity is neurological in nature, universal in design, and normative by intention. But that approach, I believe, takes poetry out of religion. At any rate, the pace and scale of Bible translation is witness, I believe, to a different reality. Translation is evidence that Christianity's neurological center has been in flux, that its vocabulary has been growing and changing, that historical experience has been a cumulative force, that the allotment of neurons has continued because neurogenesis is a living process rather than a relic of evolution, that foreign idioms have lodged in Christianity like oxygen in the bloodstream, and that localizationism in the frontal lobe of northern Christianity has shifted to the central cortex of southern Christianity, where new expanded tasks have stimulated tolerance and diversity in the religion. Translation indeed has shifted the genetic determinism of the preserved canon by encrypting Christianity with the most diverse cultural chromosomes of other societies. Old school theology appears like a relic now in the new milieu, which may explain its reported decline in its once hallowed cultural strongholds. With dazzling confidence, the old school theology stuck to etymological diagnosis and exegetical prescription without regard to God as a living reality. Expertise in the subject required only consistent methodological rigor, not lively accountability to God as revealed truth. By contrast, translation embraced a mindset to the effect that the local idiom is indeed the crucible of faith, that new idioms are not stray dialects, that God's intervention in the word made flesh is ground for embracing all flesh and the word for it as clean. The translated scripture is the charter of lived Christian experience and the church's dynamic pathway. To tell Christians, for example, that Europe is the faith, as Hilaire Belloc said, is to tell them that the faith is immobile and that an anachronistic as well. Bible translation, if I may borrow a metaphor, 
is intelligent design for the dilemma of a common humanity. Given the fractures of our existential situation, how can our idiom reconcile us unless God be encountered there? Theological science cannot discount our idioms as mere accident. In a speech on the occasion of the bicentenary of the British and Foreign Bible Society in 2004, Archbishop Ron Williams summed up the implications of Bible translation for the church in the world. If scripture can be recreated in different languages, he wrote, the humanity of the Savior who speaks in scripture must be an extraordinary humanity, a unique humanity. Every language and culture have in them a sort of homing instinct for God, deeply buried by the sin and corruption that affects all cultures, yet still there, a sleeping beauty waiting to be revived by the word of Christ. I could not put it better. Thank you. Once again, we'd like, we have a few minutes, about eight minutes, where we want to open it up for questions. And I'll run around with the microphone. You have documented the uh, influence of translation on, of the Bible uh, in changing significantly the Christian tradition and so on. Uh, in Islam, the Quran is really not supposed to be translated by doctrine and so forth. But in the recent years, there have been many translations. Do you, would you comment on whether you think this will affect the similar changes within Islam? Uh, the question about whether uh, translation of the Quran would affect similar changes in Islam as translation did in Christianity? That's the question. Uh, and my answer to that is probably not. Probably not. Um, I mean, I think there are many reasons for that. First, the Quran is really in the speech um, in which it came to the Prophet Muhammad. And whereas the Gospels we have Synoptic or John are really a translated version of the message, the teaching, and the preaching of Jesus. So, right there, right in the beginning, we have translation inscribed into Christianity in a way that is not in Islam. Secondly, and this is a the since this is a theological school, I must introduce a theological dimension to this. Um, a great medieval theologian, Al-Ghazali, um, who struggled with faith, the meaning of faith, and wrote an extraordinary uh, autobiography called Deliverance from Error. Al-Ghazali um, was a remarkably erudite Muslim scholar, uh, argued that ultimately we cannot know God talking about Muslims, say, we cannot know God is the ultimate mystery and cannot be apprehended by the intellect. Uh, we may participate in the attributes of God. This almost begins to sound Kantian, right? Not quite, not quite. <laughs> we may participate in the attributes of God, uh, the Asma'ul Husna, the beautiful names of God, the 99 names of God, and these names are, if you like, adjectival qualities. Um, God, the forgiving, the long-suffering, the patient, the all-knowing, the all-loving, and so forth and so on. And that at the human end of things, we may have characters, personalities, who are merciful, loving, um, helpful, and so forth and so on. And that way we can participate in the work of God, but as far as the essence of God is concerned, we remain completely ignorant. 
And so the beginning of the discourse in Muslim theology is not how can I know God? Um, the beginning of the discourse is how can I obey? How can I follow God's law? And the Quran is not there primarily for your understanding. The Quran is there primarily for correct observance. It's to be performed in worship, in liturgy. Whereas for us, the Bible is there primarily for our understanding. <laughs> so very different approaches. We are talking about language here, and that's kind of an esoteric term for a very personal phenomenon. Here you are in person in front of us. I'm looking for ways to get at you personally. Uh, most of us do our work with you in paper and ink, and here you are in person. I wondered, would it be possible for you to talk about your own personal experience with language, uh, your joys and your sorrows as you've done languages in your life, to, for us to get to know you better that way? Well, yeah, I, I thought, uh, talking about really my personal experience of language or languages, um, when I was growing up, I thought um, you know, I was jungle fresh, right, in those days, being an African. I thought every tree you shook, um, the fruits that fell from the tree included uh, several languages. Uh, that's I grew up really hearing several languages being spoken around me, and I just took that for granted. I thought all human, all children grew up knowing and hearing different languages, so that uh, being different for me uh, was part of the richness of life rather than the potential of a threat. Um, I think we're very bad in the West, in the Western secular idiom, at uh, sort of dealing with difference and with variety. And so when my students and colleagues talk about diversity, diversity becomes license for rejecting, repudiating difference. But I say, what is the value of diversity if you deny, suppress difference within it? <laughs> uh, let us all be one, let us forget our differences. Lo and behold, God has made us different. <laughs> Uh, the Pentecostal experience in the Acts of the Apostles, when the Spirit came down on the disciples, it was not that they said, oh, isn't it marvelous we, um, we received the Holy Spirit and now we can forget our differences. Uh, they said the opposite. They said, isn't it marvelous that we are all different, all of us, and yet we can hear God in our own native language so that the coming of the Holy Spirit was the affirmation of difference and particularity. And I think until in the world at large we learn to accept difference, but also to celebrate difference, uh, we are going to be um, very, very unsuccessful at healing uh, suspicion and intolerance. So it was very much part of my makeup. I just assume that everybody grew up uh, speaking different languages. Uh, a distant relative of mine left my hometown, disappeared, and then he emerged many, many, many decades later. He had been in Romania or Bulgaria all this time. I don't know why you do that from Africa straight to Bulgaria. But while there, he learned all the East European languages. I mean all of them. He spoke Croatian, Serb, Bulgarian, Romanian, Russian, uh, Finnish, uh, French and German, uh, Italian, Danish, Norwegian. He came back home. You know, the only job he could get was a kind of translator. <laughs> so, quite amazing. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I really, I really find it wonderful that the world has uh, preserved this diversity through Bible translation. I'd like to have a wider span to my question and a more specific one. The more wide one is about the role of the Bible in the Roman Catholic Church since Vatican II. 
I've been commenting to my classes lately that we who were alive in the 1960s were very excited about the developments. And since then, we have uh, sometimes been disappointed. I'm wondering about the Catholic Church's efforts toward translating the Bible into new languages. Are they doing that? Are they doing it in cooperation with Protestants? And the more specific part of my question is about Pope Benedict XVI and whether he has um, advocated policies that, in your uh, judgment, are helpful or unhelpful with regard to the themes of translation. Yeah, um, I, I think since Vatican II, the Catholic Church has been very active in the Bible translation projects. But Tom Beetham, um, a mentor of mine in my younger days, uh, a remarkable man, a Christian statesman, a uh, real ecumenical statesman. Um, and you don't hear his name partly because Tom was very self-effacing. Um, a really remarkable man. Uh, who knew more about African Christianity than anyone then at the time. But again, he very, very humble man, very self-effacing. Tom wrote a book called Christianity and the New Africa, published in 1968, in which he showed from the 1920s onwards the remarkable collaboration between Catholic and Protestant uh, Bible agencies in translation. I think he listed 172 different projects of Bible translation um, as a collaborative effort between Catholics and Protestants. And Tom Beetham made the point, which is absolutely valid, that on the field, on the field, in the mission field, Catholics and Protestants um, worked as colleagues uh, in Bible. And he said the fellowship of translation of the Bible brought together Protestants and Catholics in a way that no other thing did. Um, and he's been with first-hand experience uh, of this. So I would say to you, the first, when I became a Christian, the first gospel I had, St. Matthew's Gospel, um, um, this is while Vatican II was on the way, so it was really pre-Vatican II, was actually done in the 1940s by an Irish Catholic Spiritan uh, priest in the Fulani language. My mother was Fulani. So I used to carry this little pocket, Matthew's Gospel. I lost it uh, somehow. Um, so Catholics were already doing Bible translation before Vatican II. And the same thing with the SVD, uh, so the Divine Word Fathers here in Techni, uh, near Chicago, Illinois. Uh, in the 1890s, they specialized in Bible translation. And of course, that led to other things. Uh, the first dictionary of the Bambara or Bamana language of Mali was done by Father Bazin, a um, uh, French Catholic missionary, 1890s. And six vernacular translation projects in North Africa um, were done by Catholics and published by the French government in Paris. <laughs> uh, and uh, the point of all this is to say that whatever your Christianity, Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, all of us are dealing with a translated religion. All of us are. <laughs> and then there's a second question about Pope Benedict <laughs> the 16th. Um, um, how shall I say? Well, I mean, he's learning the ropes. Um, he's filling the very big shoes of John Paul II, and he's a theologian. Um, so uh, it'd be very interesting to see what, direct, what legacy he leaves. Um, but I, my view is that the Christian movement has an independent impulse. I just came from Addis Ababa on Sunday, I went to Mass, I wish I brought the service manual and read the hymns to you that we sang. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. I mean, these were um, Moody and Sankey hymns in a Catholic church in Addis, in Ethiopia. Um, fully evangelical. <laughs> um, and so I was with a um, Francophone um, African theologian, Catholic theologian, 
And he said to me on the way out, you see, even when they take, when Africans take things from the West uh, in Christianity, they Africanize them. Uh, the singing, the music, the whole body language. Uh, and for me, um, I have to tell you, confession here, that it's the only time I sort of wish I was in Africa. I really, I mean, I mean this seriously, to be able to go to worship where you actually, people enjoy worshiping God. They actually enjoy it. <laughs> Whereas in the West, that is not the experience you get. Um, but I really, I really miss that, and I sort of wish I was back in Africa, only on those occasions. <laughs> Some of, the, uh, some of my German friends with whom I have spoken about some things that I read have said to me, well, uh, what you're trying to understand, you can't really explain that in English. You have, to, you have to see that in the German. You have to read it in the German. My German grandmother used to say that too. It used to irritate me. It raises for me this question. Jesus spoke Aramaic, but we got the New Testament in Greek. Have there been uh, translations of New or Old Testament into Aramaic, and whether there have or not, would there be any merit in, uh, in our learning to read New Testament in Aramaic to perhaps get some better fix on the idioms that Jesus may have used or what he was really trying to get at? Yeah, the question really about how um, in a translated idiom you don't really get access to the full meaning of the word relates, I think, in a very, very crucial way with the theological understanding I've been trying to speak about in relation to Bible translation. And it relates specifically to the argument of the translators that Bible translation is not an exercise in linguistic perfection. And that ultimately, Bible translation is the work of the Holy Spirit, who then is able to fill the crucial gaps that are created by the fact that we are mortal, finite, inadequate, limited, in all sorts of ways, constrained, restrained. And so that's really my bottom line answer to that question, is to say that ultimately you have to trust that translation will do the work of God. But let me take it, that's, if you like, that's the, um, the sort of presumptions behind translation. Look at the effects. C.S. Lewis made the observation in his meditation on the Psalms that what is so peculiar about Bible translation is how when it's a good translation, the old idioms, the old resonances persist in almost a kind of glorified, uh, transfigured light. Um, I mean, sometimes translation is clumsy. Um, missionaries wanted to translate, um, lead us not into temptation. All right? in an African language, and they translate this rather clumsily as, Oh Lord, do not catch us when we sin. Uh, <laughs> which is a sentiment widely shared by the people. <laughs> um, but, but now they have scriptural authority for it. Or in one place, the missionaries translated, I think Romans, for all men, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the particular language, we has an inclusive sense and an exclusive sense, depending on what word you use. The missionaries didn't realize that they were using the we in an exclusive sense. So when they said, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, the people said, yeah, we know that already. <laughs> um, you people have sinned uh, among us. Um, 
not us, you have sin. So exclusive we. And then they said, but I, why do you have to come all, the, all this way to tell us that? <laughs> Now, in other ways, the translation is absolutely stunning. Uh, absolutely stunning. Um, you know, my favorite is really the verse from the Gospel of John. Um, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Those of you from a German background will realize that the word for flesh, fleisch, uh, is meat. You go and buy from a butcher's shop. So, to African ears, that sounds like Jesus is dead flesh. Um, and the translators sort of struggled with this and came up with the idea because that's what you do in translation. In translation, you translate not a word into a word, but an idea into an idea. That's really what you do in translation. Never word for a word, otherwise you destroy the whole meaning of what you're doing. So they came upon um, the idea here that perhaps they should translate it, not the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, but that the Word of God became somebody with a face, with a personality, with an identity. You can recognize this, you can describe it, and this Word as somebody dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And that, I think, shows you how Christianity, when it's anticipated well, really succeeds brilliantly. And so translation is this exercise. And remember, Bible translation, unlike translating Milton or Shakespeare, um, has this remarkable uh, predilection for simplicity and ordinariness. Simplicity and ordinariness. I, I look at my students, I say that, and nothing happens to them. Whereas I'm thinking, you know, they, they would be having sleepless nights if they understood what is in, in, involved in this concept. It's a revolutionary concept that the ultimate meaning of life, the source of life, the creator of the universe, the ultimate mystery, is suddenly within reach of our hands, right through our fingers. We can actually see and touch and feel Um, And that's why I think the vernacular uh, Bible translation created movements of social and political renewal in many of these societies around the world, because no one was unclean in the sight of God. And I remember when a Canadian missionary asked me to help them translate the Gospel of John into my language, I laughed at the idea how silly these Westerners can be, I thought to myself, what makes them think that my language is worthy to be language of scripture? What I learned later on is that God wills this from the beginning. Um, And and I spoke like this to Canadian leaders, the First Nations people uh, leaders in Vancouver some years ago. And uh, it was such an extraordinary moment for them. They begged for a meeting with me afterwards to come and talk to me privately when Americans and Canadians were not there. (laughs) And the leader was almost in tears. He was almost in tears. He said to me, this is so wonderful. Why did not the missionaries tell us that, that God speaks our language? Our people could have been saved. Our culture would have been strengthened. Because we would know that we had a friend in high places. God was on our side. Nobody told us this. I said to him, you know, it's not too late. (laughs) Going back, if I may finish to the earlier morning comment I made about historical chronology and appropriation. There's a kind of uh, eschatological principle in Christianity that having received the faith today does not place you at a greater disadvantage than those who receive the faith closer to Jesus. Right? That proximity to Jesus is not the function of faithfulness uh, in Christianity because Jesus is born in the heart of the believer wherever they are, whenever it is, right here and now. And that notion, I think, is tremendously empowering for the First Nations people of Canada 
the Australian Aborigines and for the colonized societies beyond the West. And I think this is why, if I may end on this note, that at the end of the colonial period, 1960 in Africa, was also the beginning of this tremendous explosion of Christianity in Africa. Maybe in 1960, there were 50 million Christians in Africa. End of colonial rule, 50 million. 2008, there are 395 million Christians in Africa. Maybe it, it tells you something, right? That God is on the side of the underdog. That the spirit works with, with those on the margins. And that colonialism was a barrier to the spread of Christianity. And its removal has opened the way for the church and confronted all of us from non-Western societies with the fundamental question, which we haven't started to answer and think about, and that is, what is a Christian society? Thank you. Thank you very much. We are not finished. We're going to just take a stretch break of five minutes, and then uh, we will be hearing a response from our own uh, Charles Amjad Ali. And then the two of them will uh, start a dialogue together that we'll be uh, joining in. So just five minutes stretch break, and then we'll start um, hearing from Charles. <laughs> 